This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Seated. Our scriptural text today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 16 and verse 7 through 15. Notice the word of the Lord. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit your, uh, to her authority. And then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fists against everyone and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? So that well was named Be'er Lahoroi which means well of the living one who sees me. And it can still be found between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave Abram a son and Abram named him Ishmael. I'm speaking today simply from the subject, seen, seen. Isn't it inter interesting that this servant woman, this slave woman would have the privilege of naming a well the one who sees me, he sees me. For the first time in her life, she felt seen. As a servant girl, if you'll study whenever Abraham or Sarah referred to her, they never called her by name, never gave her the dignity of calling her by name. She was just servant. She was just the help. She was just the one that was hired to do some things, but a slave girl, essentially, she was deemed as property and not seen as an image bearer of Jesus Christ, the Imago Dei. She is the image of God. God made her just as much in his image as he made Abraham, as he made Sarah, and yet because of societal things there in a caste system she is a servant girl who felt unseen unheard and unloved this is why now she runs away because she doesn't feel valued and she feels abused and mistreated and so God saw her and he met her by an angel along the way and she says for the first time, this is the one who sees me. I'm not just a worker who is in the background doing a duty, a function, and nobody knows my name. They saw the humanity in her, the, the angel of the Lord saw her. And for the first time, she feels seen. It is interesting that the greatest casualty is oftentimes just being forgotten. I never will forget going to the children's hospital up in, in uh, Memphis and there a little girl about seven years old dying of cancer. And when she was asked, are you afraid of dying? She said, no, I'm not afraid of dying. She said, I'm afraid of not being remembered. I'm afraid of not being remembered. I haven't lived long enough to do things that would cause people to remember me. I don't want to be forgotten. It reminded me of the scene in the, in the movie, The Help, 
where they, as they are training these butlers, they said, when you're in the room, the room should feel empty. As though you're the invisible man, the invisible woman. That's who Hagar was. That was her identity. That's how she felt, unseen. But God always sees. And he saw the value in her. He realized, I've created you in my image. And though you don't feel like anything, I'm going to bring something great out of you. I'm going to bring something. I, I want you to know, Hagar, that I see you. I see your pain. I see your frustration. I see your fear. I see your bewilderment. I see you. For the first time, she felt seen to the degree that she named the well the one who sees me. I have seen the one who sees me. For the first time, she was seen. It reminds us of the story in, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, of the story of the Good Samaritan. Isn't it interesting that the Samaritans, who were the despised cousins of the Jews, they knew what it was to be rejected, to be in the family, but yet the black sheep of the family, the ones who were pushed to the side, the ones that were treated as less than. So that here when a Samaritan uh, comes by the way, remember that was a wounded man by the side of the road. And the Bible says that the priest walked by on the other side. And then came a Levite also that served in, in the Levitical priesthood and saw the man in a bad situation. And he also walked on the other side. But when a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came by because he had been through pain, he had been through rejection. He had been through brokenness and hurt and saw that people didn't care. And so when he saw him, he didn't see him like the priest and like the Levite. The priest and the Levite saw him as a person or a problem to be avoided. But the Samaritan saw him as a person to be loved. So they stopped and love serves. Love helps. Love will take your own comfort and help somebody else become comfortable. And so he changed places and he got off of his animal and put the, the wounded man on his animal. He traded places. That's what love does. He did that because he knew what it was like to be rejected. When you've got people that have been hungry, they'll give their last when they see somebody else on the street eating out of a garbage can. If you've ever been to a situation where you've been cold outside and when you've been facing your utilities turned out and, and threatening to be evicted, you know what that feels like and you will give if you've got to almost come up short yourself because you've been there. It's like I see you. When you have been seen in your pain, you know how to recognize that look in another person's eyes who is also starving for love, starving for recognition, starving just for a thank you. And so this is where Hagar was. And so for the first time in her life, she feels seen. It's, it's interesting. It makes me wonder if Abraham and Sarah had ever taken the time just to simply say to Hagar, Hagar, we appreciate your being here serving us. We know that you're a servant, but we appreciate you. We appreciate you. Because gratitude is the recognition of benefits received. So if you know that you are benefiting from somebody serving you, whether they're being paid or not, uh, you ought to be grateful. I don't know about you, but when I go in a restaurant and people serve well, I'm grateful for that. If somebody holds a door for me, if they bring me a glass of water, I am grateful for that. Because people, they don't have to help you. But when they help you and when they do it with a great attitude, you ought to show gratitude toward that. Because sometimes people just take you for granted and they're so used to other people just doing it and this being a part of your job, but when they serve well, acknowledge it. Maybe you can stop somebody from feeling as though they don't matter. Nothing more says that you matter when, than somebody who stops to show you gratitude. To appreciate means to esteem as valuable. It means to esteem as valuable. Whenever you appreciate, if it depreciates, you begin to esteem it as being unvaluable. But when you appreciate, you're saying, I esteem you as valuable. That's why it's offensive to someone when they sacrifice and cook you a meal and then you turn up your nose and say, I don't, I don't like that. I don't want any of that. I want something different tonight. And the energy that it took you 
You know, I mean, food doesn't fix itself. But, you know, I grew up, you know, that you, you didn't have a choice. I mean, it wasn't where you ordered a la carte. I mean, whatever they cooked is what you ate. Or you went to bed hungry. And now it's like, oh, no, 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 I want the pizza. And the, the, the pizza's not on the menu tonight. I'm sorry. And the kitchen is closed. <laughs> it's amazing. But they, it was a way of their feeling a certain kind of way. And when someone will, will acknowledge in a home that, thank you for this meal, that was outstanding. Thank you for this labor of love. Every meal, every beverage that is served to you is coming out of some act of love some act of love and do you stop doing good things just because someone fails to show you appreciation for what you do not when you love people and you love people you do it because you love them and you do it because it's the right thing you don't do it because they always tell you thank you and here's the way that I look at it I mean the world is filled with a bunch of egotistical self-centered narcissistic mean-spirited, contumacious, and iconoclastic individuals. And so I have just resolved it in my mind that I am not going to allow who they are to make me become like them. Every time that we turn the other cheek, it is saying that I'm going to show you a better way. So even when you're nasty in, your, in what you do, I don't want to be nasty like you. I'm not going to let your meanness cause my beauty to be distracted and taken from me because you are an ugly person. Don't mess with my beauty. You keep being beautiful even when other folks want to be ugly with their words, with their attitudes, and with their look. Keep letting your light shine. Keep letting your beauty effervesce out of you in a way that makes them ultimately ashamed. You don't know who you are impacting with the beauty of a simple smile that you give to someone or a thank you that you give to someone. Keep being pleasant even when people are nasty. Keep celebrating and encouraging and being a blessing. Don't let who others are, the negativity in others, reduce the goodness that's in you. Keep being good. Don't let who they are affect who, who you are. We do what we do because it is right. We do it because that is who we are. It is our gift. Uh, the bird that sings, they don't sing because people applaud for them. They sing, but the bird sings because he has a song. The bird sings, they, they sing because they have a song. Not because somebody's going to pay them to do it again. They do it because they have a song. That's what they do. The donkey brays because that's what they do. Dogs bark because... That's what they do. They're going to do it whether you're looking or not. They're going to do it whether you tell them thank you or I hear you or not. That's what they do. And when you are a child of God, you need to do what a child of God does. We love like Jesus loves. We serve like he serves. We obey like he obeys. You know, that's who we are. And how, how, how does that help to frame my mind? It, it, it helps my mind to frame because I anticipate negative things happening. I meant when I was building the cathedral, we built a contingency fund just because some things just don't go according to plan. Things will cost more than you estimate and take longer than you anticipate. I anticipated that there could be delays. I anticipated that there could be a shortage of steel or concrete, that there could be a problem. I anticipate it. And here's what it does. Anticipation causes preparation. So it's not being negative. It's not not having faith. This is faith functioning with wisdom because faith is not a substitute for wisdom. Wisdom and faith can operate together. They are not in opposition with each other. There is a faith that has the wisdom of God with it. And so I anticipate negative things. Why do you think in the school system they would have a fire drill or a tornado drill? And now in our sick world, we have to have an active shooter drill that no child should have to go through anticipating that somebody is coming to come in their room and shoot up the place. And now that they get up under that desk and cover their heads and do all of these things, 
But these are drills so that you go through the practice of it so that if it were to happen in reality, I have anticipated this and now my, I'm better emotionally prepared so that I don't just freak out and freeze up. I go now because I have trained my body to respond to the thing that I have anticipated so that if it happened, so that if there's a fire, if there's a tornado, if there's a hurricane, I know what to do and where to go. And I tell you, I know whose name to call. So have a drill so that if somebody walks out of your life and leaves you, what am I supposed to do? Crawl under a rock and die? Think again. No, no, no. I look unto him who is able. The one that will never leave me nor forsake me. I'm going to walk with him who is promised. He is faithful who promised. I will never leave you. Human beings will let you down. Some trust in horses, some in chariots, but my trust is in the Lord. I'm telling you, he will never ever disappoint you. You have to anticipate that some people that you thought would never leave you will leave you. They'll walk out. They'll switch it up on you. Some people that you think that could never fall out of love, you think again, think again. Anticipate it. Anticipation causes preparation. Every time you open a business, you got to anticipate that somebody's going to come in and try you. I mean, we live by faith, but you know, we had one of our relatives that had a pistol. You come in there, you, you, you know, I mean, when you work hard for your money, you don't want to just see some thug walk into your place and walk out with your... No, 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 no. We had somebody behind the counter that had some Smith & Wesson. Some Glock. Faith and wisdom. They're not in con conflict. They, they walk one with another. I know some people that, that we, not only do they have active shooters in, in, uh, in the school, some of them have gone to church. We got some folks around here packing. I anticipate it. Because I want you safe. And any devil that tries to kill a child of God needs to be put in their place. <laughs> love protects, love protects, love protects. And any time that you dream, dreaming is a way of preparing you for the future. So you begin to respond emotionally in the dream as though the thing is happening in reality. When you dream of somebody dying before they die, it gives you greater grace in dealing with their death because you've already lived through it in the dream. So it, this is not a, 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 an, an anti-faith thing. This is a preparation because when God shows you something in a dream, please hear me carefully. Whenever God shows you something in a dream, it is to either prepare you for what is coming or to do something to prevent. So every dream is designed to prepare or prevent. Every dream is designed to prepare or prevent. Every dream is designed to prepare or prevent. So if God shows you something in a dream that you're going to be great, start preparing for that greatness. That you're going to succeed, that you're going to do this, prepare for it. If he shows you that somebody's going to try you, prepare for it. Prepare for it. Prepare for it. Anticipation creates preparation. Notice in, in, in verse 8, the angel of the Lord asked Hagar, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm glad that instead of giving her an answer, he asked her a question to start a, a journey. The greatest teachers in life are not the ones that give you all the answers. They're the ones that ask questions that send you on a search. Are you listening? So when you have that, you, you have somebody that asks you a question, hey God, where have you come from? And where are you going? Where have you come from and where are you going? Practically every psychologist, every psychiatrist, you, if you got a problem right now, they want to know where have you come from. 
because they generally know that the injury of whatever has messed you up in your adulthood started somewhere in your childhood. Where have you come from? I'm telling you, God has so much wisdom, it, it, will, it will blow your mind. And he's trying to take her back. Where have you come from? What kind of a mindset have you come from that puts you on a run? Where, where, do you, where do you think that you're going where you can get away from who you are? Where have you come from, sweetheart? And where are you going? Where have you come from and where are you going? Everybody needs to ask themselves that question. Where have you come from and where are you going? Where are you going? Because all of the, the hell that you've come out of, the conflict, the adversity, the sickness, the drama, you survived and a strength has been built in you. There is a resilience that has been developed in your life that you never would have been who you are. Had you not gone through that, that made you who you are now. Where have you come from? And where are you going? The two are connected. I have never seen a strong person with an easy past. Where have you come from? Where, where, where have you come from and where are you going? She had gotten her identity in being a servant, a slave. Where do you get your identity from? We normally get our identity from this idea that I am what I have. That's why people think that if you can get the certain jewelry and clothes and, and car and all of this, that you, I, I am, you know, because you got you sporting a Louis Vuitton and Gucci and Cartier. I am what I have. Well, what if you lose what you have? Then who are you? Then who are you? If somebody steals it from you, if, if somebody sues you and you lose, then, I mean, if you lose the stuff, then who are you? If I got it one time and if I don't lose who I am, I can get it again. I am not what I have. Then other people get the identity that I am what I do. I am what I do. I remember years ago, I would go out on the route with my uncles and we'd be selling all kinds of hair products and I would hear children come out in the street say, hey, here come the grease man, here come the grease man. I was saying to myself, then I ain't no grease man. You can quit what you do, but you cannot quit who you are. My identity is not locked in grease. I mean, if you work for the postal service, I, I, you know, who are you if you retire? When you retire? Who are you then? Who are you? My identity is not locked up in being bishop. It's not a title that makes me who I am. I had the gift before I had a title. You're not who you do, what you do. Some people get their identity in I am what other people say or think about me. Well, who are you when people's opinion of you changes? When their opinion changes, then who are you? If you think that you are who other people think or say that you are, then there's another thought that I am nothing more than my worst moment. You're not your worst moment. Because failure is an event, not a person. It's an event, not a person. And you're not defined by your worst moment. You're defined by Jesus' best moment on your behalf. Some people get the identity from here. This, I am where I came from. From my mama and my daddy. From whatever town that you're from, whatever high school you went to, whatever college that you went to, whatever city you're from, whatever state you're from, whatever country that you're from, they take their identity from their, their nationality or their school spirit and all of those things. But if that were the case, then everybody who's wherever you're from is all the same. And what happens if you move? Then who are you? I mean... If I transplant a pecan tree or an oak tree from one 
country to another country is still an oak tree. Your identity is not based on where you're from. It's the seed that's in you that identifies you, not the soil in which it's planted. It's the seed. It's the seed. The power is in the seed. And then some people get the identity through this. I am what I feel. I am what I feel. We, we've got this craziness in America now where people are taking their identity based on a feeling. Who are you when your feelings change? Because feelings, they're real, but they're not always factual. So you can feel one way one day and another day the next. I mean, I live next door to a lady and, I, and she seemed to be a nice lady to me, but some of the people that work for her, they came up to me one day and they said, is, is the witch on her broom today? <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying to myself, who are you talking about? He pointed to the house. I didn't know that side of her. But obviously she was not to be toyed with. <laughs> because you can feel one way one day and another another day. It's it's terrible to work for people who are moody. Because you don't know who you're dealing with today, whether it's Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde. It's, it's, you don't know what, how to walk around on the eggshells, but that gets tiring after a while. You're not who you, what you feel like. I love the words of Brene Brown that said, shame is the feeling that you get when you believe that you are not worthy of anyone caring about you or loving you that you're such a bad person that you can't even blame other people for not caring about you. And some people's esteem is damaged to that degree that they feel the shame, that they don't even feel that they are worthy of anybody caring about them and that anyone could actually love them genuinely. You see, guilt is over what you did, but shame is over who you are. When a person experiences shame, they have a problem with their identity. But I love the words of Jonathan Hessler who said that the one who knows me best is the one who loves me most. And nobody knows you better than God. God knows your strengths and your weaknesses. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he chooses to love you anyhow. After he knows the best and the worst about you, he chooses to love you anyway. In verse 9, the angel of the Lord said, to Hagar, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. And my God, that's a hard way. She's running away from somebody who was harsh because you don't normally run away from sweet people. You run away from an abuser. And she was running away from an abuser, a harsh person. But I will say this to you, that if you can endure the hard stuff, God will reward you with what you cannot put a price on. If you can endure the hard stuff, if you can endure the hardness of study, you'll be able to be rewarded with the joy of graduation. I'm just telling you that there's so much in that that if you can endure the hard stuff, God will reward you with something that you cannot put a price on. Uh, It was interesting that One of my hardest teachers in elementary school was a woman that made us learn a poem every week. She was a tough teacher. And a lot of people thought that she was mean because she was the hardest teacher in the school. But I realized she wasn't the hardest teacher. She was the best. She didn't accept uh, mediocrity out of us. Every single week, I walked in there and I had memorized my poem. It helped my mind to memorize today. I owe that to that teacher that forced me in an uncomfortable, and I was bad at the time, like, don't shoot another poem. (laughs) I'm not going to be studying over the weekend over this poem. She was the hardest teacher, and people started avoiding her. But I took her. I was so appreciative of her hardness that I wrote her a letter once, once I got in high school. I wanted to make sure I was long out of her class. But I wrote her a letter and I thanked her for helping to polish my grammar. 
and to expose me to poems that I still can recite today and that developed my mind. It was a discipline. I was in school. School is, is a discipline of learning. It's a discipline of learning. And yet the ones that we deemed as the hard teachers are really the ones who care and won't let people slide because she was more concerned about my development than my comfort. And so I allowed myself to be molded by her. But not only did I do that, I sent her $1,000. I said, thank you. Thank you. And she came here to this church in her 90s and sat right over here in this section. And, uh, and when she went home to be with the Lord in her mid-90s, her daughter reached out to me and, uh, and let me know. But I have had such fond memories over what started off as hard bitter, harsh, but it really was priceless what I got out of that. My best philosophy teacher in college was hard. He was a brilliant man, an intellectual, a, 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 a true philosopher. He, he developed, I, I was a religions major, but I was more interested in philosophy than religion. I'm a world's religion major. But because this teacher was a scholar, and so I went and sat in the front row of the class. And I knew that I had won his heart when one day he invited me to coffee with him, and I didn't even drink coffee at the time. <laughs> but here we go. Here we go. And then he invited me to go with him to the school's debate team. I think he wanted to groom me for that, but I'm like, I'm not living to argue with anybody. <laughs> But they went to others that were in the department to be able to take classes because this man had a reputation of being a hard teacher. The ones that they sometimes call hard are really oftentimes some of the best ones. And maybe this is why God was saying, you need to go back because there's a blessing in that place. And if you are concerned about your comfort in a place that is designed for your development, he says, you're going to miss out on something that will absolutely bless your life in an incredible, incredible way. And I want you to know it's a New Testament thought too, because look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. Uh, it says that you servants must submit yourselves to your masters and show them complete respect, not only to those who are kind and considerate. It's so easy to respect people that are kind and considerate. He said, but also to the harsh. Because some of your greatest development will come out on the harsh people. Just because they are mean doesn't mean that they don't have something that, that you can benefit from. I've gone into stores and, and I mean, I used to go into a store and I used to point at the cookie. In the, this is when the cookies were in the cookie jar. And you could actually have a dozen and, and still have change left over from a dollar bill. And I would go in and point and he would say to me, don't point, don't point. Don't point. He said, did number one, did number two, and did number three. Which one you want? <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you see what I'm pointing at? Don't be trying to, I'm, I'm, this is not a math class. He, he was mean as a rattlesnake. But he had sweet cookies. I was there for the cookies, not for his lecture about number one, number two, and number three, about his protocol. I'm like, dude, you see what I'm pointing at? You did number one, did not, and he would not serve you until you said, I want three of number two. <laughs> he was harsh, but he had something that people wanted. It's amazing. Sometimes your greatest blessing is shrouded in something that looks and feels harsh. Some people grew up with an old stern grandmother but now you thank God because now you're wrestling with your children and wondering why you can't get them under control. You understand now because grandmama would knock you in the head with the back of a hairbrush and uh, throw her shoe across the floor, knock you in the back of the head and send you out into the yard to have you to get switches and then she would braid them and give you a lashing. Well, you are not going to do that any, any, anytime soon. I wish we could unload a truckload of them into some of our school systems. <laughs> I want you to think about this concept. Friends create comfort 
but enemies create movement. David was promoted not by a friend, he was promoted by an enemy called Goliath. Whenever God wants to take you to the next level in life, he will schedule an enemy like a Goliath. It'll look like a giant. And I'm telling you, right before every blessing, right before every anointing that will come into your life, there will be warfare. There will be something that will be demonic that will happen where the devil is trying to come after you to discourage you. But what he is fighting is not your past, he's fighting your future. That's the only reason that they were trying to kill all of the children when Moses was a little baby. It wasn't about the baby's past. It was about where the baby was going and what he would rise up and become a great liberator. It wasn't the same with Jesus. When, when they came and there, at all the children two years and under, they weren't going after the baby's past. They were going after their future. So whenever you realize that you are going through some demonic opposition, this is to try to hold you back from a destiny that God has prepared for you. And this is the warfare that qualifies you to be able to stand in the place of blessing and promotion. It, you, the kingdom of God suffered with violence and the violent take it by force. He's trying to get you ready because there's something demonic trying to keep you out of your wealthy place, out of your blessed place, out of your anointing, out of your destiny, out of your legacy. Something is coming trying to keep you out of what God has ordained for you. He's trying to discourage you. He's trying to depress you, but you got to press your way through. It's amazing, it's amazing, it's amazing. I love the quote from C.S. Lewis that said that hardships prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. Hardships prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. And this is the principle that I want you to get today, is that strength doesn't come from what you can do. It comes from overcoming the things you once thought you couldn't. That's where strength comes from. Strength does not come from what you can do. Strength comes from overcoming the things you thought you couldn't do. When somebody tells you, if I leave you, you're going to be nothing. But the strength comes when you're able to pull yourself together and stop your crying and dry your, your weeping eyes and have to get up and sometimes press your way through tears but don't let the tears stop you let them flow and you grow let them flow and you grow let them flow and you grow keep on pressing through your tears don't sit there keep moving because god has something for you and i'm telling you there is an intelligence that god has placed in your life that you don't realize it until life cuts you there's more intelligence in our human body that we can even understand. If you got an ignorant person, I meant too dumb to turn the doorknob and to come in out of the rain, but if that person who is so simple-minded cuts their hand, the hand has an intelligence that it will begin to heal itself. I mean, it will begin to coagulate the blood and it will begin to send white blood cells there to begin to fight infection in that hand and it will cause that thing to begin to heal whether you've got any book sense or not. There's, a, there's an intelligence that is there. It is the same with life. Life will cut you, but there's an intelligence that God has placed on the inside of you to begin to heal you from all of the cuts and the bruises and the attacks of this life against you. You're designed for more than what you have right now. You're designed to be able to go place, and you don't know what you can do until you've got to do it. You don't know what you can do until you've got to do it. In verse 11, the angel of the Lord said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son and you are to name him Ishmael. And this means God hears for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. Ishmael, God hears. It's not a bad name. I mean, I met a guy named Ishmael and at first I, I said, why did your mama name you that? And he said to me, do you know what the name Ishmael means? And I wasn't thinking about it in the moment. I said, remind me. The young man said, God hears. God hears. God hears. God wanted both Hagar and Ishmael. He wanted Hagar to know, I see you. And he wanted Ishmael to know, I hear you. The Bible says, in fact, that the Lord heard the cries of the lad. 
He heard the little boy crying. He heard Ishmael crying, and it captured God's attention. God was concerned about the cries of a little baby who was sitting out there because the mother had put him over up under a tree and waiting for him to die because they had run out of, out of their portions. And God heard, God heard. When God said to Hagar, I see you. And when he said, Ishmael, God hears. I see you and I hear you. It was God's way of saying, you matter. You matter. And that's why whenever you want to connect with somebody, always use your ears. Your ears will connect you to a person's heart. The ears connect you to the heart. The ears connect you to the heart. So when you listen, listen with your ears. Listen with your posture. Listen with your expression. Listen with your heart. Listen with your ears. Listen with your whole being. Listen with everything that you have. Put your phone down. Listen. Children respond to you differently when you give them your undivided attention. If you come in and you got a, a digital distraction in your hand, they will go back into their own imaginary world and begin to entertain themselves and you miss a critical opportunity for them to feel as though they matter. And if you don't let them tell you the little things, when they get older, they won't tell you the big things. You are building a road in the hearts of children for them to be able to trust you just because you listen. So particularly with our young children, you have to hear, use your ears to hear their heart cry, to be able to hear their pain, and also to be able to hear their little dreams so that you can encourage them. And I want you to know that some of you might feel like Hagar, that you're unseen. They're the people who feel unseen that end up creating some of the most heinous crimes in our society. They're the ones that will go to a school and do a mass shooting because they were ostracized. They felt unseen. And that unseen uh, nature caused them in this isolation to become angry and listen to the voice of demon spirits and, and fester in some type of perverted desire to harm others. But God cares. We're reminded of that in Psalm 34, verse 15 through 19. Notice that the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right and his ears are open to their cries for help. God hears you when you're crying and wetting your pillow. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil and he will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. The Lord is close to to the brokenhearted. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. God cares. God cares. God cares. And wherever you are, before you do anything foolish, I would always say this, practice the pause. Practice the pause. God paused Hagar in the wilderness. He paused her because she was about to do something that was going to affect her destiny and the destiny of her child. Practice the pause. The angel, the visitation was to practice a pause. Practice the pause. Pause before assuming. Pause before accusing. Pause before uh, when you're thinking about abusing. And pause whenever you're about to react harshly. Pause. Practice the pause. Between stimulus and response, there's always a space. And that space is a time to use the, the freedom that we have to give us the power of choice and to do the right thing. You need to practice the pause. Practice the pause. And listen, just because you've had a harsh experience in one place, just because the last thing that you did didn't work, I want you to hear me prophetically today that just because one harvest that you sowed for didn't do well, do not let that stop you from sowing for another harvest. 
There are some seasons that are bad seasons. But as long as you stop, there'll be another season that will come around. And you'll be able to plant and water again. And while sometimes a freeze will come and love will walk out of your life, God will send warm weather again. So just because one crop failed, don't let that depress you out of sowing seed again for another harvest. Because something that failed in one season, I tell you in the name of Jesus, that God, if you will walk upright, God will send favorable winds your way. My God, the favor of God will begin to bless you even out of your foolishness, even when you have wasted resources. God is faithful and able and you're getting ready now in this new season of obedience to say, God, I'll walk where you want me to go. I'll do it, Lord. I may have missed that. I've let that go. That was a terrible crop, Lord, but I'm believing for this harvest. It's harvest time. I'm telling you, there's some things that are going to spring up and God has given you more wisdom this time so that when the harvest comes, now you've got a wisdom to be able to know what to do with the seed that comes from this from this harvest that God wants to bless you with more than you need so that you can be a blessing even to other people. This is your season. God is about to send favorable winds your way, favorable weather your way. He's about to rain on your fields this time. The last season was dryness. Some of you are coming out of a funk. You're coming out of a dry spell and you didn't even know what was wrong with you spiritually. But I declare in the name of Jesus, hey, there are winds that are blowing and clouds that are coming in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, your harvest will be of such abundance that God will stop the attention of the world to ask, how did you get that? How did you become this? How is this? And God says, I'm going to open up a way for you to be able to declare your testimony of what marvelous things that the Lord has done. This is a new season. Don't you dare count God out by what went bad in this season. Your next is not going to be like your ex. Your next, eh, eh, papa, si your next is going to take the blessings of God this time, Lord. I'm going with you all the way. This time, I'm going to follow your plan. This time, I walk with wisdom. This time, I walk with the favor of God on my life. This time, I walk with counsel. This time, I walk with praise and thanksgiving in my heart. This time, it will be different this time. It will be different this time. Declare that with me. This, it will be different this time. Say it again. It will be different this time. Say it again. It will be different this time. Say it again. It will be different this time. <laughs> Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Every failure that you've been through was a part of a down payment and an education to prepare you for where God's ready to take you now. It is true, I've never seen a strong person with an easy pass. And the harshness that you've been through now, God is saying, go back and submit yourself. Because if you're able to do it this time, if you can make yourself uncomfortable, God says, I will bring a blessing in your life that you won't even be able to put a price on. You're not going to be able to see what I'm going to do in this season. And this time, well, you, you felt like you wasted years, God will accelerate time. He will accelerate time. He will accelerate time. He'll accelerate time. And what in other times took years, it'll now take months and weeks. You watch what the power of the Holy Ghost is able to do. God will breathe on your fields, and He will do that that will be exceptional. And I mean, in this year, I'm telling you, when you serve God, in a year of famine, God can cause you to have the biggest harvest of your life. When famine, when the world is in famine, God can so bless you and breathe on you and give you a harvest of ideas, a harvest of strength, I declare in the name of Jesus. When he tells you, I want you to possess the land, I want you to expand on the left hand and on the right. When God tells you, I'm not trying to get you comfortable, I'm trying to get you developed. I'm trying to get you expanded. I'm trying to get you blessed. I'm trying to get you walking 
in a new anointing to be able to trust God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, to be able to acknowledge Him in all of your ways, to say, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus, in this season of my life. Who am I talking to in this place today? I declare that this time is going to be different. Some of you have almost thrown your hands up because you've been depressed over your own children and over your family situation. But I declare to you, God is able to turn it around. The arm of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save. He is still a healer. He is still a deliverer. He is still the one that is delivering and healing and setting free and casting devils out. This season will be different. This season will be different. This season will be different in the name of Jesus. Your anointing is getting ready to go to another level. Your wisdom is getting ready to go to another level. The spirit of wisdom and revelation. Hey, God's going to open up your ideas. God is getting ready. I'm just here to tell you in the name of Jesus. I feel a prophetic release in this place today that God is going to allow things to come to you in your dreams, in your sleep. You tried it one time, you got frustrated, you got frustrated, you got frustrated, but I hear the Lord say, go back this time. This time, let your net down on the right side of the ship. This time, right relationship, right partnership. This time, this time, this time, this time, this time, this time it will be different. Yes, 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 yes. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh all flesh all flesh all flesh shall see it together this time it's not gonna be done in the boot in the back in the corner in the dark God says I'm gonna let you you're not gonna be able to contain the glory he says the glory is gonna flow out the glory is gonna flow out the glory is gonna flow out that's glory 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 Me corremans kite bins membres, but skolora poring ge firis nundu break atasana. There are some of you that have been waiting, says the Lord, for Him to deliver you out of the situation. But He said, "This time, my deliverance shall be through." In the same way that He parted the Red Sea to take them through, shall your situation be parted? But you must go through it, and as you walk through it, your faith will increase, your strength will increase. Your wisdom will increase. Your stamina will increase. Your resilience will increase. You must go through. You must go through. You must go through. The way out is through. Hey, Be But he's bringing you out. He's bringing you out. He's bringing you out. You got to walk it out. You got to pray it out. You got to shout it out. You got to praise it out. I declare to you in the name of Jesus, you're not going to be zapped out. You're going to walk out. You're going to walk through it. You're going to walk through it. You're going to walk through it. And I tell you, your testimony is building day by day. My glory to God. Glory to God. The glory of God is getting ready to shine on you like you've never seen before. The glory of God. They're going to realize this is God. This is God. This is God all over you. This is God. This is God's favor. This is the favor of the Lord. This is the strong arm of his deliverance. But he will walk you through it. He will walk you through it. And he will be glorified. He will be glorified. He'll be glorified. He will be glorified. In the name of Jesus. 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 God says, I see you. I've seen your affliction. I've seen your isolation. I've seen your frustration. I've seen your anger. God says, I see you. I see you. I see you. And you've been crying out to God. And you've been wondering, Lord, why haven't you spoken, Lord? Why, why are you so slow and moving? God says, I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. He, 
He doesn't wear a watch. He's not on our schedule. Do not count him unfaithful because it does, hasn't happened on the schedule that you tried to put him on. God is God. It was 25 years with Abraham. He got impatient in the process, but God taught him something. Even in the midst of that, God is faithful. God is faithful and he's working on something on your behalf. I feel his presence in this place. I feel that God wants to carry a people and do something through you. You've been in the obscurity long enough. Yes, he is calling you now. Saying Zacchaeus, come down. You, gained, you went up in the tree to see me, but he says, I saw you. Come down. I'm gonna dwell in your house tonight. I'm going home with you. He says, you climbed to see me, but I really saw you. And while you're thinking that nobody is thinking about you, God has you on other people's minds. And your name is coming up in conversation that you don't even know anything about. And God says, I will go and prepare a place for you because there's a story that is in your life and God says, I will draw the people to you that need to hear that story. I'll draw them to you. I'll put them in your path because they need to hear of the story of God's glory in your life. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. It's not designed to be hidden and put on the bushel. The light of God's glory, the light of God's glory is designed. And I'm telling you, this is a new day. It's time for you to let the garment of shame The best that I can describe what I'm seeing in the spirit now is like what happens in a fashion show and models go behind the curtain and they change their garments. And he's about to give you beauty for ashes. Shikabat soloko. Things that have burned and fallen to pieces, your plans that went south, God is going to give you beauty for ashes. Yeah, bella frotto le mensi. He's going to give you beauty for ashes. Beautiful ashes, it is God's way of saying to you that you're not going to look like what you've been through. Hey! There's going to be a change of your garment. That change of garment is a change of role. It is only God who can cause ashes to be turned into beauty. Whatever crashed and burned, but God will raise it up. This time it'll be for his glory. And you've got a responsibility to tell the story because the glory is locked in your story. And it's not really about us, it's about what he did in us and what he did for us and what he did through us and when somebody sees what God did through you it'll stop them from giving up go back and revisit your story and tell it and relaunch it again and get it out because the world needs your story and when you were in obscurity and God saw you it'll connect with someone else who feels like they are the least qualified. The Apostle Paul said, I'm the least of all of the apostles. I, I'm lowly, I'm not even worthy. John the Baptist said, I'm not even worthy to tie up his shoes. But God's about to give you beauty for ashes. He makes all things beautiful in their time. He makes all things beautiful beautiful even the ugliness he makes all things beautiful all things beautiful stretch your hand toward these folks that are up here father 
May the force of favor, Shambraco Tomasi, the force of your goodness and your grace, unleash, unlock, reveal to these, O oh God, what you have prepared for them. Open their eyes, let them see. And may the first thing that you allow them to see, God, be the fact that they are seen of you. That you see them. Now, Lord, may a fortitude, a strength, come down into them. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you have used the fire that they have gone through to purge them of some of the foolishness, the craziness, the poor decisions. Thank you. Thank you for letting everything fall and fail that was supposed to fall and fail. Thank you for that. But thank you for even out of the ashes of our poor decision, our poor actions, our poor behavior, that you give us another chance and you rebuild something of beauty and glory and honor so that it becomes a testimony to others who look at us and realize this is the marvelous work of the living God. God help us to realize that we are seen, that we are heard, that we are loved. And then give us eyes to be able to see others who need to be seen. And to hear others who need to be heard. And to love others who need to be loved. Use us as an instrument of your divine peace that what you've done for us, in us, and to us, that now, God, you will do through us. Make our eyes as your eyes so that others feel seen. Make our ears as your ears so that others will feel heard. Make our hands as your hands so others will feel embraced and loved. And may your glory, God, shine all about us. May we, Lord Jesus, in the next 18 months, barely be able to recognize that we are the same person on this day. I thank you for your incredible hand that will cause a miraculous harvest to flow in our lives. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we trust you for it. And we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.